I'm Mike Farrington, welcome back to the boardroom. In this video, I'm gonna build a storage cabinet for my drill press. Along the way, I'm gonna share a raft of cabinet making pro tips. I'm also gonna show how I build a unique drill press fence with a cool magnetic stop. And for a little extra credit, I'm gonna show a jig that I use to drill concealed cabinet hinges with, as well as some OCD satisfying storage solutions. I get started by breaking down a couple of sheets of Baltic birch plywood. I rip to width and cross cut to length. Next, I set up the mighty dado stack for a one quarter inch dado to accept the cabinet back. On to the joinery. I line up and lay out the bottom and sides and make a couple of tick marks across the seams. I transfer those tick marks around to the ends so they're visible. For cabinet making duty, the Festool Domino normally isn't my first choice. I'm a biscuit joiner kind of gal most of the time, but I'm trying to work on my relationship with the Domino, so I added a Seneca auxiliary fence, and that seems to have improved it to tolerable. I also add a few pocket holes. These are added to help during glue up. And speaking of glue up, here we are. I use a urethane glue for two reasons. One, it has a longer open and assembly time than traditional wood glue. And two, because it's not water-based, wood won't swell when the glue is applied. So parts tend to slip together nicely when using this glue. While the case is drying, I shift gears and mill up some lumber for a face frame. I use my double taper sanding disc to creep up on the finished width of the styles. My target is two thicknesses of plywood, which in theory is an inch and a half, but in reality it's something slightly less than that. Why I'm using this dimension will make sense as the cabinet comes together. The benefit of using the disc to creep up on the fit is it's easy to take off small bits. Also, no further sanding to the inside edges is needed. If you'd like one of these discs for your shop, I'll have a link below. Now that the face frame parts are milled, I use a few delicious biscuits to help locate them on the cabinet box. I start with the styles. With those in place, I can cut the rails to fit so they are snug as a bug in a rug. Pocket screws and glue make for an uber strong face frame that's fast and easy to build. Said face frame is adhered with traditional wood glue this time. I use a flush trim bit with V-groove on the seam between cabinet and face frame. Not necessarily needed for this application, but this trick helps hide any imperfections that may exist between the cabinet and face frame. Similar to my lunch, this cabinet is being built from leftovers. As such, I didn't have a piece of plywood large enough for a solid bottom. So I made a little base molding type of thingy. For a cabinet that will have casters attached, I think a double thickness bottom is important. And after the miters were dry, I glued and nailed it in place. Sp 
Speaking of casters, I carefully mark, drill for, and install a set of casters. I really like this type. They lock in two directions, both the wheel and the rotation. When locked, these things are rock solid. Nextly, it's time to install the drawer slides. For this, I use the Bloom Universal Drilling Template and a 5mm drill bit with a stop collar. The jig is set to drill the first hole 37 millimeters from the front of these plywood strips I milled up. The 37 millimeter measurement is a cabinet industry standard for hardware holes. By drilling this hole in the right spot, the drawer slides will be installed accurately from front to back within the cabinet. After drilling the first and second holes, I make an adjustment to the jig and drill a third hole which will carry the back of the drawer slide. Here's why I milled the face frame styles to two thicknesses of plywood. When these strips are in place, the slides are padded out perfectly. Also, I have the added benefit of being able to use a spacer to locate the strips so they are consistent from side to side and parallel with the bottom of the cabinet. All this adds up to drawers that will function properly. And now the time has come to affix the drawer slides to the cabinet sides. Garth, that was a haiku. I use screws called system screws, which are designed to fit into the five millimeter holes I drilled earlier. Oh, and they're posi drive, not Phillips. Here's what a posi driver looks like, but Phillips will work well enough in a pinch. The heads are low profile and fit into the holes in the drawer slides with zero play. This will prevent the slides from sagging over time as is the case when using pan head screws. I slowed this clip down so you could clearly see me cutting out strips for the drawer boxes. Two strips for each box, I'm using half inch plywood. I run a one quarter inch wide by one quarter inch deep groove to house the bottoms. The drawers are held together with glue and brad nails. This is plenty strong for a drawer box that is running on ball bearing drawer slides. I check for square by measuring diagonals. I make any adjustments needed and then I drive a few 3 8 inch staples into the seam between the bottom panel and the groove. This adds shear strength and holds the box square while the glue is drying. With the drawer boxes built, let's take a closer look at how I install the other part of the drawer slide. I start by using a marking gauge to mark the center of the slide. Next I mark a line where the first screw will be installed and I use an automatic punch to create a dimple that will prevent the screw from wandering. I like to use the holes that allow for front to back adjustments. Using the ones that have up and down adjustment can allow the drawer box to sag over time, which is the opposite of what we want. When driving short screws like these little 7 16 inch shavers, it's easy to over torque them, stripping out the plywood and weakening the connection. So, I pull my head out of my rear end and pay attention to what I'm doing. To make sure the slides are a consistent 1 8 of an inch from the front edge of the drawer box, I use a double square for final positioning. The marked lines make installing the last couple screws an accurate and easy event. While performing this tedious task, I have the drawer box clamped in place. A stable workpiece is much easier to work on. The payoff is a drawer that slides as smooth as single malt scotch down, 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 down into my belly. Now it's time to install the drawer fronts. I use shims to create the reveals top and bottom, and I just eyeball the reveals left and right. Once I'm happy with the position, I clamp the drawer front to the drawer box and use a few screws to hold it in place. For shims, I'm using pieces of 1 8 inch thick Baltic birch plywood, which is actually 3 millimeters, but it creates a nicely sized reveal. I use 1 inch screws with a generous countersink and pilot hole so the threads don't bind, but rather pull the drawer front tight to the drawer box. I hold the top in place with my favorite mechanical fastener, the screw.
After installing some cheapy poles, this well-built, solid, sturdy, hefty, robust, and brawny cabinet is ready to be test-driven to its new home. With the cabinet built, it's time to move on to the table and fence. My opinion on the table is to keep it simple and make it very easy to replace so the whole surface is considered sacrificial. In this case, I just have a single layer of MDF bolted directly to the drill presses table. Where I prefer to spend my time is on the fence. Like any tool, a good fence with a stop for repeat work is critical. For years, I've been using a piece of wood and some clamps, and this works totally fine, but an upgrade is always welcome. I get started by marking the edges of the MDF table on a piece of wood, then I mark 3 16 inch over from that line, which is half the thickness of the 3 8 inch bolt I'll be using. This is where the shop apprentice and I will drill a hole. Not too bad for a 4 year old. Next, I drill a couple holes in some one inch scrap plywood with the same bit. Then I trace around the top of the bolt. I guess these are called T-slot bolts. After chopping off some extra material, I route a slot for the T-slot bolt head to fit in snugly. I route down to a depth of approximately one quarter of an inch. The thickness left that wasn't routed is slightly less than the three quarter inch thickness of the MDF table. This will all make sense in a couple of minutes as the video unfurls majestically before you. I cut right up to the edge of the hole on one side and then cut to length on the other side. With the bolt as a guide, I glue these blocks to the bottom of the fence. I check for square and I use the star knob as a clamp. I also add a second clamp because I'm totally hardcore. I call this shock wire. Fortunately, I don't use this router in the shower. Rather than having a new cord installed, I'll just pretend the problem doesn't exist. That seems easier. I add a nice crispy burnt chamfer to the top edge of the fence. I'll also pretend that my chamfer bit isn't totally dull as well. I use my two horsepower hacksaw to cut down some 3 16 inch by one bar stock. 1 8 inch would have been fine, but that was all sold out. I countersink and drill a few holes to house some number seven wood screws. I use a Vix bit to drill pilot holes and finally screw the flat stock to the top of the fence. At this point, the fence is done, so I turn my short attention span to the stop. I used metal bar stock on the fence because I thought it would be cool to use a mag switch, which I think is short for magnetic switch, to hold the stop in place. Using this switch for a stop is convenient because there are no tracks or grooves to deal with, so removing the stop from the fence is about as easy as falling off a log. Nothing special here. I drill a hole for the mag switch, then glue and clamp squarely the thingy that the workpiece will bump against. While I'm at it, I decided to cut a chunk out of the fence to allow it to scoot a little further away from the drill press quill. Let's take a look at how all this comes together. The fence slides off and on the table easily, and the T-slot bolts grab the edge of the table securely. The stop is super secure. I used a 150 pound switch. If that's not overkill, I don't know what is. And it adjusts and comes off lickety split. But wait, there's more. Magnets, as it turns out, are attracted to metal. This means I can store the stop pretty much anywhere on the drill press. Now it's time to have a look at a really neat jig that drills a three-hole pattern for concealed cabinet hinges. It can be used with a hand drill or a drill press. I'm going to do a custom setup for use with a drill press. So I get started by adding a block of wood to limit some of the travel. 
and I remove the fence that's provided as well as the base. A feature that is of particular interest to me is that the drilling aggregate can be removed and replaced with ones that have different patterns. This one is for bloom hinges, but aggregates for all of the major hinges are available. This is great for repair work where I could run into any number of different hinges. I cut out a new super large base and mark a reference line to help locate the two holes needed to attach the jig. I drill the two holes and reattach the springy up and down part of the jig. I also cut out a fence with a special notch to fit around the base. I mark and drill for a couple threaded inserts that will be used with some star knobs to hold the fence down. Hey, look at that, it actually works. I reinstall the drilling aggregate and use the point of the bit to mark a center line on the base. From there I mark lines at three, three and a half, and four inches from center. These are my standard distances I drill cabinet doors at. I also add a few scribe lines in one millimeter increments. These will be used to set the fence so it bores the hole at the correct distance from the edge of the cabinet door. And here's a look at how I install it on the drill press. It only takes a minute or two, and my drill press goes from traditional drill press to cabinet door boring machine. Allow me to toot my own horn for just a moment, but this thing works totally awesome. Being able to use Bloom Inserta hinges that clip on and off is a big convenience. Breaking a project down for finish and delivery is a piece of cake when using these hinges. I also like the large work surface, perfect for drilling cabinet doors. I ended up adding a hole so I could hang this guy on the wall out of the way when not in use. I consider this mini project a total win. Let's move on to a couple drill press storage solutions. After rehabbing this 1940s drill press, there's a video on my channel, you should check it out. I realized the bits I'd been using were pieces of junk. A nice drill press with junky bits is no good, so I invested in a set of Forstner bits in metric and imperial. I also picked up a full set of high quality twist bits and a few brad point bits. For the Forstner bits, I wanted them sitting on something upright in one of the drawers I built. So I cut out a piece of scrap wood to fit the drawer tightly front to back and then drilled a bazillion holes, one for each bit, and voila, neat and tidy. For the twist bits and brad point bits, I used yet another scrap of plywood, cut a bunch of grooves that were just roughly sized to each bit, this doesn't need to be perfect, and added a divider and then labeled each slot. A little rudimentary, but plenty effective nonetheless. So there it is, a random bunch of projects for one of the most useful tools in the wood shop, the drill press. Hopefully you found this either useful, interesting, or at the very least, not vomitous. Thanks for watching, till next time.